Okay, good morning, friends. So in today's class, we will we will be learning about uh, the meaning of tillage, tilth, then weeds, classification of weeds and weed control, and the cropping patterns or the cropping systems. So now, as you know, the farmer is always busy. During rainy season or uh, up to this rabi season, he'll be busy in harvesting his crops. And when it comes to you know summer days, even in those summer days, hot summer days, also he's not free as such. And he prepares his soil ready for the next crop. So these activities a farmer to prepare the land ready for the next sowing is what is known as you know tilth and the tillage so here what he does is by undertaking tillage practices he modifies the state of the soil which becomes suitable for raising a fresh crop is what is known as tillage now tilth is the resultant of tillage as a result of tillage practices the final stage of the final state of the soil which is porous which is friable which is granular which is smooth which is powdery which is suitable for the seed germination for the root penetration root establishment for the growth of the seedling and for uh, flowering, fruiting, etc., and to check the weeds and to preserve the moisture that is there, to supply the compost and the other organic matter you have put into the soil so that it reaches or it supplies the nutrients which are there hidden in it with the microbial activity. So for all this to happen, he has to prepare the soil. So these various practices adopted by this farmer using various implements and finally converting his hard soil into a porous, friable, granular condition is what is called as the tillage. Now what is the aim of the tillage? You know, Unless and until the soil is suitable for raising, for sowing the seeds, he will not be in a position to raise his crop. So, for uh, the preparation of uh, the soil, for the removal of the weeds, if any, and to take out and remove the previous crops, crop residues and the stubs, and the root system, etc., and um, you know, and uh, uh, so that uh, the soil becomes easy to in get itself incorporate whatever the manures and the organic matter that you have added. All these things can be achieved with various practices adopted by the farmer using various implements. So this is the aim of tillage. So to repeat, the aim of the tillage is to make the soil suitable for seed germination, root penetration, removal of the you know, weeds and uh, retention of the moisture, incorporation of the you know, crop residues, and the manures that you have added into the soil. So these are some of the aims and objectives with which the farmer undertakes the tillage practices. Now, now you know, we will read one by one. See, first of all, the seed bed preparation. That is, see, in certain crops, such as your rice or onion, etc., there you undertake what we call transplantation of the young seedlings. So this seed, he has to prepare seed bed, wherein he will spread the seed, 
they germinate and then he gives regular you know water then when they become uh, you know or 10 to 15 cm then he will again water it and uh, pull these seedlings without any breakage in the root system and before that he puddles is uh, uh, you know field into various embankments he waters them and through puddling uh, he prepares those plots and he takes out he takes these seedlings and ultimately transplants them so here for this good seed bed preparation the activity of what we call tillage is needed and as already told you weed weed removal is done uh, when uh, he undertakes plowing deep plowing uh, the seeds get re removed and even the stubs of the previous crops get exposed even if there are insects or their larval forms etc etc uh, when he takes up uh, when he plows those underlying uh, eggs and the larval forms get themselves exposed either they will be picked up by the flying uh, uh, you know um, birds or uh, with the hot summer hot rays of the sun destroys them so thus his field becomes devoid of these damaging weeds then uh, even the soil structure physical structure of the soil now here the main aim is to make the soil porous so that water holding capacity increases it becomes aerial that is air exchange becomes easy so that the microbial activity will be at its peak with this the whatever the organic matter you have added it gets putrefied it gets oxidized so that the minerals get released then uh, the soil drying see if the soil is wet soon after your heavy rains you know soil becomes wet in the wet condition generally you cannot take up various agricultural practices for taking up agricultural practices what is it the soil should be semi dry so to make to convert this wet soil into dry you take uh, what we call you undertake uh, plowing so with plowing uh, the soil underlying wet soil comes up and gets uh, dried then pest control even the crop residues and other stubules uh, which may have been infested by insects and pests they get exposed you can get removed of them by undertaking what we call plowing so even the finally of course crop already told you crop residues previous crops residues the stubs and the fallen leaves and other material they get incorporated into the soil and whatever the manure it could be composed your farmyard manure etc whatever you have added that gets incorporated into the soil so for all these to happen he has to undertake what we call tillage now this is the aim of the tillage now the implements see the tillage practices for our convenience can be divided into two what we call primary tillage and secondary tillage primary tillage is preparation of the land for seed bed or for sowing so making the soil ready for sowing or for transplantation or seed bed preparation this is what we call primary tillage now what about the secondary tillage so in secondary tillage what we do is after raising the crop after what we call sowing the seeds in order to escape from the eyes of the birds you undertake what we call you you cover the seed with top soil then after uh, when the seedlings grow to a height of 15 or 20 cm by that time you will see generally you know the seedlings are generally sowed in lines you in in between the inter uh, lines or in between the two lines you see the place that is infested with weeds weeds tend to grow there so if you want to have you know good yields you have to remove these weeds unwanted plants this you can do by doing what we call 
the um, you know small blade harrows or what we call danti or cultivator or by physical means uh, that is what we call uh, you know hoe etc and machine operated various equipments are there so the tillage practices which are taken up after the establishment of your crop in order to get rid of primary aim of it is to remove the weeds and to do uh, practices that help in the retention of the moisture so such practices which are taken up after the sowing seed after the establishment of the crop so such practices are known as secondary tillage practices whereas primary tillage practices generally you take up before sowing the seed so it is a preparatory thing that is a, a inter cultivation where in, in order to get rid of your weeds you take tillage practices so they are known as secondary so primary and secondary tillage practices now after knowing this uh, primary and sec secondary tillage practices now let us know something about uh, what are the implements generally a farmer uses to do primary and secondary tillage practices now the um, you know first of all uh, you know as far as examination point of view is concerned generally they will ask you draw a country plow or a mould board plow so a mould board plow or country plow country plow and mould board plow is a, generally you get them under short modes so you try to practice them you try to you know practice the picture of them and also try to name them so now uh, first of all um, uh, you know this country plow this is a common uh, you know uh, implement or an instrument which every farmer has in his uh, uh, you know field so generally country plow you know generally uh, the entire structure is made up of what we call you know wooden and only share share is the small piece of uh, you know iron that is fit into a u form groove made into this uh, uh, what we call uh, body shoe and into that this share is embedded and it is fixed with certain nails and this helps you know for uh, penetration of the plow deep penetration of the plow and for the removal of uh, uh, you know um, a, any a material maybe your stubules or your uh, you know weeds etc is because of the sharpened shear that is fitted in the, into the plow so now generally the wooden parts are generally made of what we call uh, the common wood that is available in the village areas uh, like your uh, acacia 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 species acacia arabica or your ajadirikta indica that is neem or even some cases teak if teak is available it is made up of teak so in all cases it is primarily made of a wood but only share part is what we call a um, iron now this will be drawn by uh, by a pair of bullocks so this generally um, you know farmers take up this during the summer especially when there are pre monsoon summers one or two summers are uh, summer showers are there after that you know generally uh, the farmer takes uses his uh, country plow and plows his plot or the soil or the land so here uh, you will see what we call a v shaped furrows will be generated and the underlying uh, soil comes onto the top but the thing is here so uh, here certain unplowed areas remain and the thorough mixing of the top soil uh, subsoil does not take place in this but this is the common implement and generally made uh, of wood and very convenient even for the repair etc but there are certain shortcomings that or that can be um, checked by use of what we call a an iron an iron made what we call a mould board mould board plow this is made of iron only but here whatever the shortcomings 
whatever the deficiencies that are there in the country plow plowing are removed by use of this so here you don't get any gaps and here the earth will be um, thorough mixing of the earth will take place or the soil thorough mixing is possible and uh, you can by using this uh, you know uh, mold board plow you can cover the plowing uh, very fast very fast even the energy needed uh, there for uh, dragging for plowing uh, country plow you know you need uh, oxen which are uh, strengthy but here that much of energy is not needed in this so here unplowed areas will not be remaining and uh, the thorough mixing is possible here so in case of country plow you will see what we call only it stirs the soil but here not only stirring but inverts the soil that is subsoil and the topsoil gets mixed thorough mixing will be there and i already told you uh, the unplowed areas will not be uh, available uh, in case of uh, mould board plow but they are there uh, if you do tillage with the country plow and of course i already told you v shaped uh, furrow will be there whereas here uh, the mould board plow leaves what we call a rectangular furrows will be there and uh, generally i told you um, it requires uh, now generally uh, uh, more drought is needed here less drought is needed here and uh, uh, even uh, uh, for the operation of uh, uh, the country plow it can be operated under varying condition but here uh, some exact some percentage of moisture is very much needed for the operation of this mould board plow so now these are some of the so country plow and mould board plow these are the two important uh, plowing instruments that are in use in indian and even in ap and telangana areas now uh, then there is one more uh, you know implement what we call drill or guru seed driller or guru and generally as the name indicates it is primarily used for drilling the seed in most of the you know most of the crops generally drilling of the seed will be there taken up and this driller is nothing but uh, your guru that is being used and this seed driller or guru can also be used as a, um, you know as a plow if the soil is not heavy in the light soils even this can be used as a as a plow and this can cover you know you can cover because there are three spokes uh, are here so the, you can cover so mostly three or six tined drills are there so that you can cover larger areas now apart from this uh, so here by, in both the cases in mould board plow or in a country plow at the end you will see big lumps of soil big clots of soil clots of soil if it is a black cotton soil you know clots of this size clots which are of uh, uh, 10 kg or 15 kg clots of mud are expected so you you cannot take up immediate sowing there so they they have to be broken to pieces for breaking them you need uh, you need to use other set of uh, you know tillage implements such as what we call harrows number of harrows are there for example disc harrow is there where uh, uh, discus disc like structures are there and uh, this is used in breaking this big clouds and uh, of course our country made and commonly available is what we call blade harrow is there this is what we call in telugu what we call guntaka and this is the another uh, um, you know another uh, commonly available um, implement that is in use in almost all the areas here uh, the you know beam is there of course handle is there and uh, the cutting edge what we call palugu and that will be of uh, you know 75 to 100 centimeters will be there and uh, it we it is also being drawn by a pair of bullocks now its primary purpose is to break the clots and to and to level the soil to level the soil to break the soil even after immediate uh, um, you know drilling of the seeds generally in order to cover these uh, exposed seeds even uh, the farmer uses this guntakar the blade harrow behind uh, uh, you know either guru or what we call plow
So its primary purpose is to break the clots and to level the soil, to pulverize the soil and to cover the uh, seeds that are sowed. And also it helps remove the, you know, uh, weeds if any. And also it helps, you know, even to either to dry the soil or to retain the moisture in the soil as the case may be. So now, in addition to that, we have what we call liberals are there, cultivators are there. Cultivator is, uh, this is here, it is made up of fully iron. Generally, these are, are drawn by, uh, mostly by tractors. Now, there is uh, one more implement that is what we call a bund farmer. A bund farmer is there generally. We employ this uh, in the wet cultivation. So wetland cultivation during the puddling condi conditions and also in order to um, you know, retain the water generally, we make uh, what we call bunds. So there is a, a bund farmer that helps in bund constructions. So these are the implements that generally we use. And uh, then uh, we, we move to what we call, uh, I told you, the secondary uh, intercultivation um, uh, practices. Generally, I told you, uh, Danti, wherein this is, uh, there are uh, three small, you know, um, it is not a very, uh, very similar to the, you know, blade harrow, but here the blades are very small. The 10 to 15 centimeters, generally it will be drawn by a pair of bullocks and three people will be operating that. Its main purpose is to remove the weeds in between the crop lines. Generally crops are there in lines. So in between the lines you have vacant area where um, the weeds generally come. So generally uh, if you employ, you know, if you employ labor, it will be um, uh, its cost will be very high. So in order to, so the work of 10 labor can be done by three people using a, a, a pair of bullocks by using what we call this danti. So even there is one more what we call metla guntaka. Generally, it is a big wooden block where the number of uh, these uh, uh, folks or uh, uh, dantis will be uh, more than uh, more than more than three, but this will be, uh, it can be operated by a single person. So now as a result of, as a result of tillage, what you get? The tilt. Tilt is the physical condition. Physical condition of the soil after various tillage, tillage practices that is available, that is readily available to undertake uh, um, either for sowing or for a seed bed. So this is the final physical condition having loose, powdery, granular, crumby soil. That is the final, final condition of, uh, of the soil after your tillage practices. What you get at the end is what we call tilth. So now uh, this is what we call the tillage. So here the objective of the tillage, seedbed preparation, weed control, improvement of the physical condition of the soil, soil aeration, soil drying, pest control, and incorporation of the crop residues or your organic matter that is being added for easy root penetration. So these are some of the, you know, um, tillage aims and objectives of the tillage. And those are the implements. Now this is uh, the tillage and the tilth. Then we move to uh, the second unit uh, that is next unit that is weeds and weed control. Now, what is a weed? What is a weed? An unwanted plant. A plant at an unwanted place or a useless plant. This is the common definition for a weed, an unwanted plant. A plant that is has no economic value for the farmer. If it has no economic value and an unwanted, it could be poisonous. A plant growing in an area where it is not desired, where it is not desired. So this is uh, what we call uh, the meaning of a weed. See, for example, uh, the meaning of a weed differs or depends on the attitude of a person. See, uh, 
the definition of a weed for a farmer is different from the definition uh, uh, in the viewpoint of what we call uh, an Ayurvedic practitioner or a, a, a pathologist, a scientist who is involved in the research of pests, etc. So, an unwanted plant. Say, for example, this, for example, a wheat crop, a wheat plant growing in a sorghum or in a maize. So, your main crop is sorghum. If you see a wheat growing in it, so that wheat is here, a weed, not a crop plant. So, it is unwanted there. Same plant, for example, all these weeds, what we talk, what we uh, discuss about, they are very useful for a, a, a medical practice, an Ayurvedic medical practitioner, because e, there is no plant as such, including your weeds, having no medicinal value. But for the farmer, his, his main intention is to grow a crop. So uh, now the weeds, what is the, what are the negative effects of the weed? What are the general losses that a farmer inc incur if he fails to remove weeds from his field? So generally, the crop yield gets diminished. The quantity gets lessened. The quality also gets poor. Even they pose health hazards. Mm -hmm. See, um, why, you know, uh, the quantity gets, why the yield gets lessened because the weeds which grow along with the crop plants, they compete with the crop plants for moisture, for the, you know, uh, for the, um, for the important uh, um, mineral elements, your um, fertilizers. And for the space, they occupy the space. Then, when you go for harvest also, along with uh, your crop plants, you are harvesting even the crop, uh, the weeds. Now, weed, weed seed gets mixed with your crop seed. When you sow in the next year, when you export it to some other countries, along with them, you are exporting even them. Say, for example, uh, certain whatever the exotic weeds, what we call Parthenia mysteroporus, Congress grass. That does, doesn't belong to India. It came to India in 1960s when we imported what we call you know, wheat from US. It is an exotic plant. So like this, they get exported. So in their, their, with their presence, the quality of the seed gets diminished. If it is infested with uh, you know, these wheat seeds generally, you, you do not get remunerative price. If you eat them along with this, and you are you you become indisposed. So health problems will be there. So your low quality will be there. Uh, reduction in quantity will be there, and the health hazards will be there. Even the cost to production. Why? You you are supplying fertilizer. So fifty percent of the fertilizer will be utilized by your crop, and the rest will be utilized by the crop. You know weeds. If you want to get it get them removed, what you have to do? You have to employ labor. So you, you were, uh, uh, by employing labor, you know, you, your cost uh, of uh, your cultivation goes up. So these are negative. But of course, there are the other side of the coin. Not for the farmer. Of course, to a certain extent, even to the farmer, they are, they are in use. For example, they are used as leafy vegetables. Many are used as vegetables. Say, for example, many are there, your, uh, what we call, Lucas Aspera, what we call Tumi, Uttarini, Ekirantas Aspera, um, your, uh, what we call, Kinopodium is there. These are all, these are all, uh, you know, leafy vegetables. Silosia is there. You can use them as vegetables. And the medicine, of course, I told you, every crop, every plant, has some or the other medicinal value, including our uh, you know, weeds. Now, generally, some weeds are used in making paper. Some are used for thatching your houses, for huts, thatching. For example, saccharum and other, uh, you know, 
uh, typhoid, etc. They are used for thatching your houses. And uh, uh, some, you know, for beautification of water bodies. For example, if they, you were... Uh, Nilambo is, is there, your Pistia is there, your Icornia, if they are there, here and there, in a water body, water body, they add to the beauty of the water body. But their excessive growth, of course, will uh, uh, deteriorate, will hinder uh, the beauty of that water body. So, even uh, some are used as pollution indicators. Some are used as pollution indicators. So, and most of the weeds, if they are there, you know, if it is a fallow, if you are not growing a given piece of land, if you leave it, you know, you see growth of various weeds, including your grass. Now, the presence of the grass, it checks the soil erosion. And even when uh, water rain drops fall also, they, they take the force of the uh, rain drops. So thereby, uh, your fine uh, topsoil gets secured. So these are the uh, beneficial effects of what we call uh, the weeds. Now, the important thing is, see, uh, weeds, you know, um, their competition will be very, very uh, tough. Why? Because they are, they, they are better adopted because they are wild. They grow very fast. See, you, you are sowing a seed and you are not sowing the seed of uh, any weed. They are there. They are there in the soil. So bo both of them sprout simultaneously. But when compared to your crop plant, you know, they grow very fast. They grow very fast. For that, you know, they absorb whatever the moisture that is there, whatever the minerals that are there, they absorb, they exploit that. So at the cost of your crop plants, they grow very fast. And, you know, when they come for flowering, you know, they come from flowering before your crop comes for harvest. By that time, they complete their life cycle. They shed their seed into the ground, into the field. And because the seeds are very small, you know, they get dispersed either through air or through your, what we call animals. Some have, you know, what we call fruits have some, you know, um, spiny structures on the surface. They cling to the skin of or to the cloth of uh, the farmer and they, thus they get uh, transported to the new areas. And when you go for what we call exports, etc., or import, etc., they get uh, dispersed even to far off places. And not only through seed, you know, they, their reproduction rate will be very high because they will not only go for sexual reproduction, but also for vegetative propagation in the form of, you know, what we call runners, stolons, are suckers, are tubers, rhizomes, etc. Not only they they remain deep inside the and they perinate the unfavorable conditions. So that is how uh, they cause a lot of loss to the farmer. So now uh, then uh, this uh, uh, what is the now uh, this is very very important for you as for exam is concerned. You know they'll ask you what is define a bit and. Uh, uh, give the classification of weeds with suitable examples. Or um, how can you classify a seed and uh, mention uh, the various, uh, uh, you know, uh, various practices that are adopted by a farmer to get rid of them. How you remove, how you can get them removed. Or how you can check them control measures. What are weeds and what are the various, uh, you know, um, various methods of uh, weed control. So now weeds, you know, weeds are primarily classified based on uh, three important criterion. Uh, the first is what we call based on their lifespan. Second is their angiospermic character. And uh, the third is what we call uh, special features. First of all is based on their lifespan. Lifespan means for how long they live, how much time they need for the completion of their life cycle. Say, for example, based on the lifespan, we can classify them into annuals, biennials, perennials. Annuals means within one season or one year. Biennials, in the first season, they first year, they show vegetative growth. Second year, 
they enter into reproductive phase. Perennials, they live for many years. Annuals, common, common. Your uh, grasses are there, your uh, tradax procumbens is there, like a scamolis is there, eclipta alba is there, your uh, cypress rotundus is there. So these are all some of the panicum, the small grasses and etc., which are commonly found here and there. Very fast. Annual. Biennials, for example, Echiranth Echiranthus, of course, Echi you know, Alternantha Echinata is there. Uh, your, uh, uh, what we call, um, Olden Landi Umbellata is there. Merimi Imaginata is there. Uh, and uh, um, Echiranthus Aspera, Ipomia Reptans. These are some of the biennials, which need two seasons, two years. Perennials, of course, perennials are, some are herbs, some are shrubs and trees. Herbs, some are herbaceous. Say, for example, herbaceous, example, your Silosia, Abutilan is there, Tephrosia is there, Indigofera is there, Cypress. These are all what we call herbaceous perennials. Perennial, they live for many years. And uh, woody, woody, shrubby and woody, example, your Prosophis, Tamarix. These are some of the examples of uh, you know, perennials. So annuals, biennials, and uh, perennials based on the lifespan. Then, uh, you know, based on the angiospermic characters. Angiospermic characters, based on the angiospermic characters, we divide the flowering plants into two groups, monocots and dicots. Monocots are narrow-leaved and they have what we call parallel venation. And the other is dicots where uh, they produce, uh, you know, seeds which have two cotyledons and the leaves possess what we call uh, reticulate venation. So almost the uh, uh, so monocots, you know, generally monocots means here narrow leaved parallel venation, single cotyledon in the seed. Almost uh, all the members of what we call cypressi, graminea, jenkesi, these are some of the examples of uh, what we call monocots. Say, example monocots, uh, even under monocots also. There are uh, annuals, perennials, etc. are there. For example, our common Garica, what we call Cynodon is there, Panicum is there, Cypress is there, Citeria is there, Saccharum species. These are all uh, some of the Echinocloia and uh, uh, Imperator are the, the, some of the um, you know, annuals which fall under what we call monocots. So then we move to what we call broad-leaved. These are narrow-leaved. And the broad leaves are only dicotyledons. So under dicots, of course, you have annuals, you have biennials and perennials. So here, annuals, Amaranthus is there, Euphorbia hitra is there, Philanthus madras petisans is there, Silosia argentia, these are some of the annuals. Biennials, Alternanthera is there, Plantago is there, Acanthus permum hispidum is there. These are biennials. Now, perennial, they live for many years. Example, Convalvulus is there, Abutilon Indicum is there, Ephrosia is there, Lantana is there, Aristolochia is there, Fasciolus trilobus, Silosia, Polygonoides. These are some of the perennials that live for many years. Okay. Now, based on special features. So, based on lifespan, based on angiospermic character, the third is based on special features. Based on special features, they can be classified into what we call poisonous, parasitic, and aquatic. First of all, poisonous. So, based on special features, some weeds are poisonous. Not only for human, even for the cattle. Example, your Datura fastosa or your Solanum nigrum, Vithenia somnifera, or Lachnera pusilla. Lachnera pusilla. These, when uh, uh, they form, they when they are taken along with the forage, the uh, cattle gets indisposed. Even if the seeds, if our food gets contaminated with them also, even children and adults do suffer because they are poisonous. They have many alkaloids in them. For example, Datura, you know, Atropine is there, hyosamine is there, and Vithenia you have with an um, alkaloid, somnifera is there, and these alkaloids uh, are very poisonous. Then parasitic weeds. 
some weeds are parasitic what are parasites generally you know plants are autotrophs but there are certain plants which are parasites because they are non green if a plant is non green it can't prepare its food no photosynthesis it has to depend on other organisms for its food such organisms are parasites but of course here parasites are of two types crop plant parasites are of two types one is complete parasite the other is incomplete parasite or partial parasite complete parasites are non green whereas partial parasites are green these partial partial parasites depend on the host for its water and minerals they get connected by sending hasturia their hasturia gets forms a connection between what we call phloem and through the phloem and uh, they draw ready food and water minerals etc so this is uh, a complete parasite and a, a partial parasite again they can be classified into two what we call root parasite and a stem parasite root complete parasite for example our cascuta and uh, uh, sorry complete stem parasite is cascuta and partial stem parasite is your cassita viscum etc and complete root parasite is uh, orobanchi and partial root parasite is example striga see you need don't get uh, you know scared if you remember one or two examples for each category that makes your uh, you know answer a good answer and it fetches you good marks okay so this is a, a parasites then finally aquatic some you know um, these um, plants unwanted plants are seen even in water bodies i told you if they are there here and there of course they add to the beauty of the water body but if they are found in excess good example for this is our hussein sagar in hyderabad is infested with what we call icornia crassipes luxuriant growth excessive growth it it is spoiling the water body fishing becomes difficult even boating becomes difficult even noxious smell bad smell it emits during summer so this pistia maybe icornia uh, uh pistia could be there your icornia will be there and in some cases your ipomia will be there nymphia will be there hydrilla will be there salvinia will be these are some of the water plants if they are found growing in excess they cause an impediment even for swimming for boating even for consumption the water becomes you know unportable even it uh, emits bad smell so these are aquatic plants so these are all a classification of weeds now the final point is what we uh, the more important as such is after knowing about the uh, you know um, the importance of uh, the positive and negative sides of the weed after knowing the definition of the seed we we learned about the classification of the weed then we move to what we call how to get rid of them how to control the weeds now the control of the weed is by three means one is a mechanical a biological and third one is what we call chemical what is physical physical method physical method means here you employ um, uh, laborers you pluck them unwanted plants by using hand or by using hand hoe etc you remove them it is easy if it is an annual if, a, if the sufficient moisture is there you can pluck them but your cost of production goes then of course by using what we call secondary tillage practices i told you by employing your danti etc you can get rid of them then by moving by putting uh, you know soil over them they get killed even by spreading sheets etc on the on them on the surface of the weeds uh, because they 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 are not exposed to sunlight and because underneath of a sheet plastic sheet the temperature goes up and uh, for that high temperature they they die so these are all you know physical means then the what we call biological control here biological control you have to remember here here by in biological control eradication is not our aim to control their population is the a so here what you do generally you employ enemy of enemy organism to control their population so here generally if it is a, a exotic weed i told you 
we we the lantana camera or iconia crassipus or our uh, what we call opensia delinea opensia uh, prickly pear so these are alligator weed the, these are they they doesn't belong to india they came to india in due course and they are posing a problem to our water bodies and also for our lands so here you 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 search for their natural enemies from their original areas so generally the scientists have uh, you know identified various bugs various insects they eat the foliage leaves of these uh, noxious or these problematic weeds so so if, for example um, a good number of examples are there uh, for example this lantana lantana is controlled by what we call lantana bug and uh, um, octotoma scabripiensis is another bug you know which eats the leaves of lantana and once we foliage is lost means uh, the plant uh, number gets reduced no flowering no fruiting and prickly pear what we call opensia species this is controlled by what we call moth borer cactoblastis cactorum is the insect that feeds on the uh, this prickly pear even uh, the alligator weed is by uh, is uh, controlled by what we call flea beetles flea beetles are released into the area where uh, we, uh, the alligator weed poses a problem so these are some of the uh, uh, examples by employing their enemies natural enemies in the form of insects in the beetles you can control them even there are certain uh, you know certain cases wherein you employ pests or you employ what we call a certain fungi to control them say for example fungi like a, a what we call cephalosporium uh, has been proved to be controlling acacia glauca a weed by name acacia glauca can be controlled by releasing by infesting it with what we call cephalosporium and paxenia condrilina is another uh, rust uh, that you know makes uh, that infest what we call uh clandrilla gentia a weed and controls them so here as to repeat you know generally this biological uh, you know control is very very good but here uh you control their population but you do not go for their uh, what we call eradication now the third one is what we call uh, herbicides what we call chemical control you use chemicals to control them now you know the um, the cost of production of uh, Uh, for raising a crop has gone up and because labor costs have um, enhanced you know if you want to lay, uh, employ a labor for a day you have to spend uh, more than 500 or so so the cost of production goes up so uh, and even uh, the sufficient number of labor is not available and uh, if you employ them late by that time you know uh, they they overtake over uh, your crop plants and uh, uh, late removal will not yield you good results so by using these chemicals nowadays uh, farmers are going for what we call herbicidal uses use of chemicals to control uh, uh, them is what we call um, you know chemical method of weed control and uh, the good thing is uh, you 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 the cost will be very less of course you can cover larger areas in a short span of time and uh, um, very easy even to uh, control what we call spiny weeds and uh, what we call few laborer problem can be checked and easy cropping crop harvest will be there and the health problem certain weeds cause allergies and that can be they can be removed easily by using uh, these herbicides and uh, and uh, in a short span of time in a short span of time the herbicides are very uh, you know specific say for example herbicides that uh, kill uh, your monocots may not harm dicots and uh, if it is a rice or a wheat there the dicots are weeds if it is a rice wheat there the dicots are uh, weeds so in either ways you have you know herbicides which are specific for uh, you know monocots and some are specific for dicots so you can choose them you can employ them so good number of uh, 
such uh, herbicides are there. For example, butachlor is uh, one herbicide and uh, 2,4-D is one herbicide and uh, glycophosphate is another herbicide and atrazine is uh, uh, another. So these herbicides are some are pre-emergence, some are post-emergence. So pre-emergence means before the uh, before the sprouting of your weed, if you add these to the soil, they, they, they do not allow the seedlings of the weed to sprout. In some cases, they are sprayed, you know, after their emergence. So pre-emergence and post-emergence. Now, the most important thing you have to remember uh, while using these uh, herbicides is, so um, you, you, you cannot use them indiscriminately. Indiscriminate use uh, is not only uh, you know uh, you 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 will be losing a lot of money, but you will be spoiling your crop and also the uh, uh, environment in larger area. Your water bodies get spoiled. Your environment, your air, your soil gets spoiled, and then there could be what we call these uh, chemical residues will be there even in on your fruits and seeds, etc. So one should be very very careful. And for doing this, uh, what you have to do is you read all the you know, precautions that are there on the label and don't use the expiry, um, you know, these uh, weedicides or herbicides and uh, use them in the quantity, in the right quantity, in the right calibration and spray them, spray them. While spraying them, you know, uh, the um, correct uh, pressure has to be maintained and the spraying should be done at right time, either in the morning or evening. And uh, while spraying also, you have to cover your nose and mouth and your eyes, et cetera, of course, by using glasses, et cetera. So, so that this uh, chemical reaches the target plant. So this is uh, what we call herbicide. Then we move to what we call cropping patterns, cropping systems. Now, you know, what problem we are facing nowadays is day by day what is happening? The area under cultivation is getting diminished. And the other day I have seen, you might have read, you know, 30% uh, of the cultivable land has lost its uh, ability to support. It, it has become barren. It has become infertile. Why? Because of drought because of excessive use of pesticides, because of excessive use of uh, your insecticides, pesticides, and your chemical fertilizers. On the other, what is happening? Day by day, the population of a country is growing. The population is increasing in geometrical proportions when food output is increasing in arithmetic proportions. So, what we have to do? So, the learned people like you and me and the agricultural scientists are doing their level best, doing a lot of research. And because of their research, now high-yielding varieties are available. So in 1960s, 70s, generally, by using these high-yielding varieties, which are produced through various breeding programs, through various breeding programs, we have short duration varieties, which yield very high. And they have disease resistance, pest resistance. So uh, because of that, you know, because of use of high yielding varieties, because of better uh, um, irrigation facilities, by using chemical fertilizers, using pesticides and insecticides, and providing uh, what we call marketing facilities and storage facilities, etc., we could achieve what we call, uh, you know, uh, sufficient food pr production. That what we call green revolution but this is one side but on the other side if you look at what's happening it has uh, you know harmed your soils your environment the cost of production has gone up so one has to be very judicious while using all these things your fertilizer pesticides etc they should not be used indiscriminately so here what i mean to say is the land the area of the land under cultivation there is no scope there is no scope for expansion. It is day by day getting diminished because we are going for, in the name of modernization, big roads are being led, 
big factories are built and uh, a lot of real estate is taking place wherein the cultivable land is converted into what we call living place so day by day the area under cultivation is getting diminished now what is what should we do we have to use whatever the land that is available in a scientific way so that you can enhance your output so this is the prime aim of your uh, cropping system in good old days when uh, of course it is not exaggeration even after 75 years even 60% of a cultivable land farmers depend on rain we have only 30 35% of the land has assured irrigation but still we depend on rain god so rains nowadays you know erratic monsoons you don't get rain when it is needed you get rain when you don't want it this has become very common now so here uh, our prime aim should be to use the whatever the limited resources you have your whatever the limited land you have you have to use it in a more scientific way so that you can enhance your yield and output so here uh, now uh, for this what we do uh, certain uh, technical terms are there i'll try to explain them see for example uh, soil cropping soil cropping means at a time you if you grow only one crop in a area your land that is what we call soil cropping you grow only one say for example you are raising wheat you are raising uh, for example only sorghum you are raising only wheat rice etc only one crop at a time in a given area that is your soil crop against to this what we call intercrop intercrop means here generally you grow more than one crop at a time say for example you are you are raising sorghum along with the sorghum you grow what we call uh, your green gram or black gram or our red gram so raising two crops at a time on the same plot this is what we call intercropping why intercropping this is a, uh, this is a common practice from times immemorial even in our epics there is a mention about uh, this mixed cropping or intercropping so this here you know this is important because by unforeseen means if any damage occurs to the main crop farmer has to wait for the next year for the produce so here if one crop is lost at least some amount of uh, produce in the other crop so they a, a kind of assurance a kind of insurance if you grow two crops one is lost at least they are from that you get little assurance that will be sufficient for the it is to meet his uh, essentials for the farmer so this is what we call soil cropping and uh, intercropping then what we call monoculture so continuous growing of only one crop year after year year after year if you grow only one crop that is what we call monoculture then crop rotation here instead of growing the same crop you go for what we call crop rotation one after the other one 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 year you grow one crop and next year you grow for example if you sow uh, sorghum this year then you sow what we call green gram or red gram one so if you raise you know some maize this season this year then you go for cotton the next year so you are rotating this is what we call rotation or otherwise uh, crop rotation then the important thing is what we call multiple cropping raising more than one crop in the same field in one year you raise more than one crop on the same plot in one year this is possible because of the availability of short duration varieties with the available irrigation facilities you 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 harvest the first crop then you 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 make your land ready and you go for the next crop in another 30 days you know 100 days you again harvest you go for third crop so mainly this is possible in case of rice this growing the two or more crops in any year on the same land or the same plot is what we call multiple cropping 
Now in this multiple cropping, there are two, you know, one, one is what we call, if it is a rain fed area, no assured irrigation is there. Then what we do is uh, a, a relay cropping and sequential cropping. In multiple cropping, there are two, again, two types. In relay cropping means, generally this is practiced in, uh, um, you know, delta -like areas where alluvial soils are there in East and West Godavari areas, Krishna area, where in the first uh, Karif season, they grow rice and before harvest, when, when it is ready for harvest, just one week before the harvest, the farmer, you know, spreads, you know, either green gram or black gram. Then he harvests. Then by the time he removes his harvest, the whatever the seed he has sown, pulse seed, it comes out, it sprouts. He gets the second crop in 60 or 70 days. So here, relay means here, before harvest of the first crop, you sow the second crop. This is a relay. Then against to this, what is there is one more kind, what we call relay sequential. Sequential means if there is assured irrigation, there is no need for to rush. Then you harvest your first crop, then you go for tillage, then either puddling or otherwise, then you raise your second crop. So if you raise the second crop after harvesting the first crop, that becomes your special crop. If you raise your second crop before the harvest of the first crop, it becomes relay cropping. So by relay cropping or by, uh, you know, sequential cropping, your main aim is to get maximum yield from the given land. Then, of course, there is one more what we call retuning. Generally, this uh, retuning generally is um, in case of sorghum and more uh, particularly in case of sugarcane. Generally, you harvest the sugarcane, then uh, whatever the stubs and whatever the you know leaves, etc., that are fallen, you know, generally they are burnt and then uh, the farmer irrigates, supplies water. Then in due course, uh, whatever the buds that are there in the stubs, you know, they sprout. You get the second crop without sowing. So raising the second crop from the steps of the first crop is what we call retuning. This is retuning. Now there is one more thing what we call main crop and base crop. Say for example, if you are raising, uh, if you have orchards, for example, you if you have you know, mango orchards or uh, lemon orchards or what we call uh, coconuts, etc., or you were, uh, uh, what we call cashew nuts are there, they come from harvest they take at least two or three, four years. So farmer, instead of leaving this space vacant, he, ra he raises either pulses or vegetables in meantime. So this is the another way of profitably using the moisture, the soil, and the minerals that are available in the soil. So this is how the, you, uh, you go for maximum exploitation of the resources that are available with you. Of course, land is the most limited resource you have. So in that limited resource only, you by raising multiple crops, you are feeding, you are getting good returns. So this is uh, what we call, um, and, and now, you know, uh, the in multiple cropping, in intercropping, intercropping is again two types, you know, in some is what we call inter uh, separate lines. If you're uh, raising this uh, two crops at a time in separate lines, that becomes intercropping. For example, three, four lines of your uh, sorghum, then you raise what we call one line, uh, your uh, red gram. Or you, you grow what we call, um, you know, green gram or, uh, or black gram. And here and there you sow what we call uh, sorghum. That is intercropping. Mixed cropping means you, you mix the seed itself. Then you go for sowing. They are there everywhere. That is a mixed cropping. Now, um, uh, the crop rotation, of course, crop rotation, I told you, raising or changing the crop every year. You grow a cereal this year, you go for a pulse next year. So uh, generally, we change a, a pulse with a cereal or a millet. Why? Because you know, these uh, cereals or millet, millets, generally they have shallow root system, fibrous root system, which spreads only to limited area. Whereas your, uh, um, you know, 
pulses for example if you take your uh, red gram uh, it uh, its root system is very lengthy it prints a deep so here because their spreading of the root system is at different levels so they will, they will be drawing their nourishment from different levels and not only that pulses because they have what we call root nodules they add to the fertility of this soil so this uh, way of this practice of raising um, different crops one after the other a cereal a, a, a pulse this is what we call a crop rotation through this crop rotation not only the fertility of the soil is maintained but here you know the infestation by your pests by your weeds you can check them because they have what you know host specificity pests you know a pest attacking a sorghum will not attack um um a, a, a pulse a, a, for example a, a pest that attacks a fungus that attacks uh, your pulse will not be attacking a, a cereal so by rotating you know even so is the case with your insects also if you grow them you know because they remain in the soil and uh, they attack the crop next crop so uh, th th that's why you give breaks so breaks either in the form of what we call crops or in some cases fallowing you don't grow any crop you leave the soil like that only for one year or so this is what we call fallowing so by fallowing by changing a pulse or a cereal or a millet alternately is what we call crop rotation through crop rotation your yields will be more and you will be uh, retaining the fertility of the soil you will be checking the um, you know population of the weeds and also yes so these are some of the uh, you know techniques of uh, what we call uh, uh, cropping patterns through which you can enhance your crop yields so this is about uh, today's uh, lecture and uh, uh, if you have any uh, query you can ask me i'll clear them or else uh, uh, we will be meeting on the next saturday and sunday that will be our uh, my, you know last uh, Saturday, Sunday, next two classes. Two classes are over and next two classes are there. In those two classes, we'll try to complete uh, uh, the important topics because it is not possible to complete the entire syllabus in four classes. Generally, for regular classes, generally we need 20, 24 classes. So that 24 classes syllabus, we are uh, 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 trying to complete in just four classes. Of course, we are not uh, uh, doing justice but because of time constraints, because of the directions of the university, we have to follow. It is mandatory on our part. So any query, uh, if it's not there, uh, let us say a good boy and let us call it a day. Thank you for listening.